Let me introduce Dr. Gupta first. Uh, Dr. Gupta is our interim chair for nephrology and also medical director for the renal transplant, and he will be uh, introducing our speaker, Dr. Agarwal, for today. Thank you all. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So it's a pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Rajiv Agarwal, who's a tenured professor of medicine at the Indiana University. He earned his medical degree from the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. Uh, we share an alma mater. Uh, he did his residency and fellowship at uh, Texas at UT Southwestern, and he's now a professor of medicine at Indiana. Uh, he's also an internationally re recognized leader in the area of hypertension and hemodialysis patients. Uh, he's been funded since for, from the NIH since 2003 continuously, uh, and he's had several recent publications, very high-profile publications for hypertension in the New England Journal of Medicine, as well as other journals. It's an honor to introduce him and have him speak to us today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gupta, for inviting me uh, to VCU to give uh, medicine grand rounds. And I'm delighted to uh, do this uh, uh, in person because uh, most of us have gotten used to Zoom and we've been asked to do so many Zoom conferences that it almost seems unreal that there's a real world that exists <laughs> beyond Zoom. I know a lot of people are joining virtually, but uh, here's the title of my lectures, Preventing Cardiovascular Disease and CKD Progression in Type 2 Diabetes Associated CKD. It's something that has really exploded over the last uh, a few years, and I'll try to get you up to date on this. Here are my disclosures. So, here are the objectives of the presentation. Uh, I'm going to uh, go through each one of them as we go along. Uh, diabetes affects nearly every organ in the body, and we are not going to focus on uh, uh, other organs except cardiovascular disease and kidney disease progression. Uh, if you look at the epidemiology, we find that there were about 4 million deaths in 2017 worldwide. And cardiovascular death is the major cause of, uh, of uh, deaths in people with type 2 diabetes. Most of it is actually uh, shared by countries that can least afford it. And it's really a global uh, epidemic. Now, there are lifestyle interventions that can modify CV risk in type 2 diabetes. And sometimes we forget that the lifestyle interventions are important because they can be important for prevention of diabetes, for prevention of cardiovascular disease and diabetes. And even if you have cardiovascular disease, it can prevent the future development of outcomes. So lifestyle interventions is really important. And I'm going to spend some time talking about it because um, you know, we sort of give a lip service, yeah, 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 you know, uh, but uh, maybe we can walk through some of the data on the diet, for example, um, and these are guidelines from the American Diabetes Association, which suggests a diet that is uh, rich in fruits, non-starchy vegetables, legumes, whole grain, low fat, fat dairy. And uh, they, it's kind of simplified by the people at the Chan uh, School and Harvard Medical School. And they sort of uh, draw a plate and say, you know, they. Uh, most of your plate should be uh, the green zone where you have vegetables, uh, fruits of all colors, whole grains should be limited to, uh, you know, uh, the, you shouldn't have too much white bread or uh, starchy potatoes and healthy protein, you know, size of a deck of cards is what they say is a serving of meat. And <clears throat> they sort of simplified, but, you know, we, uh, sort of uh, look at the data behind it. And this is a really a high profile trial that was published in 2018. And it really asked the question, can dietary interventions prevent cardiovascular disease? This is the PREDIMED trial. Very few trials are done of this magnitude. So I wanted to highlight this. And it basically was an open label multi-center parallel group uh, randomized trial of Mediterranean diets in Spain. They had um, several thousand patients, uh, 7,447 patients, randomized to three different diets, either a Mediterranean diet with extra virgin olive oil, a Mediterranean diet with mixed nuts, or a controlled diet, which was just an advice to reduce dietary fat. Uh, 
And they're looking at hard outcomes, which is a composite of MI stroke and cardiovascular death. And uh, these are people between the ages of 55 and 80, 57% are women. They don't have any cardiovascular disease at baseline, but they have high cardiovascular risk. Median follow-up, 4.8 years, and the trial was stopped early because they had overwhelming efficacy for the endpoint. The five-year absolute risk for cardiovascular event, 5.9% in the control group, and 3.9 and 3.4% respectively in the nuts and the extra virgin olive oil group. The relative risk reduction is about 35%. You can see that very few medications or interventions would argue with this 35% risk reduction with a simple intervention like this. Now, physical activity is something we all know, but you know we now have very nice guidelines, and these are the six S's of physical behavior over 24 hours. This is American Diabetes Association came up with this and says, okay, if you want to sit no more than 30 minutes at a time. Stepping, yes, it's important to step and you know, you try to achieve 10,000 steps a day, but you know, uh, it would require a fair amount of walking. Sweating, everybody knows, right? It uh, says, okay, two and a half hours of uh, moderate physical activity. It could be cycling or brisk walking per week or half as much of intense activity. So it could be 15 minutes, five times a week, but no more than two days break in between. That's, uh, that's the part about sweating. Strengthening are things like yoga and tai chi and says, you know, the strength training is important. And they say, well, we should also worry about sarcopenia, especially in the elderly people. People who are older than 60, they tend to have a stable weight, but they're losing muscle and gaining fat. So what we call a sarcopenic obesity, and that's something to watch out for. And sleep, they say six to eight hours of uninterrupted sleep, that's what you need. And that's why they say, this is your behavior over 24 hours as very nice six S's that they have put together in the new guidelines that they just came out in 2022. Now, you have all heard about stepping and says, okay, 10,000 steps, where did that information come from? So somebody did a meta-analysis. You know, we live in this information age and there are eight published studies, seven unpublished studies, uh, more than a quarter million uh, person year of follow-up and what they uh, asked was, what, how does it relate to mortality? And it turns out that if you're over 60 years of age, you don't need to step 10,000. You can do between 6,000 and 8,000 steps per day. That's where you reach the plateau. But if you're younger than 60, yes, 8,000 to 10,000 steps is needed. But look at the steep line. If you're really inactive, that's where you get the most bang for your buck. You know, if you're stepping 500 steps and you double or triple it, that's where you get the majority of the benefit. So even a little bit of stepping will help. You want to get to the plateau. If you are younger than 60, then go for 8,000 to uh, 10,000. If you're older than 60, 6,000 to 8,000 is sufficient. What about weight? Well, there's actually some uh, very interesting studies, the uh, lifestyle interventions for weight loss. And this is uh, really a remarkable study because uh, NIH uh, typically would tend to do four or five year grants, but this is a grant that they give for 10 years to look at uh, uh, weight loss in people with type two diabetes and asking the question whether it reduces cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. That's a pretty ambitious uh, trial. So it's called a look ahead trial, 16 centers all in the United States. It's published in 2013, so nearly 10 years ago. It's got an intervention group that uh, has decreased caloric intake, increase in physical activity and a control group, which is simply diabetes support and education. And there are 5,145 patients with type two diabetes, obesity or overweight who are randomized to these two groups. The endpoint is a harder endpoint of MI, stroke, CV, death, or hospitalization for angina. 13 and a half year follow up, so truly long term as a randomized comparison. So, what did they find? Well, weight comes down pretty dramatically uh, in the first year. You can see the blue dots, that's the intervention group. 
comes down pretty dramatically, about 6% more than the uh, control group. But even after 10 years, there's a 3% mean difference between the two groups. Physical fitness improves dramatically and it continues to be separated. The waist circumference drops, it improves, but you know, uh, doesn't uh, quite hit the control group and the glycated hemoglobin improves. Unfortunately, it didn't meet the primary endpoint. So you couldn't really reduce the cardiovascular outcomes, but if you look at the intermediate endpoints and ask how many people postponed the need for starting insulin, there were more. How many people had uh, less uh, 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 bedwetting? You know, people were getting incontinent and when they actually lost weight, they were continent for a longer period. They had less falls and fractures. I mean, there were benefits that they saw that was not the primary endpoint. It doesn't mean to say that weight loss doesn't work. It just didn't meet the primary endpoint. Even a more ambitious study, it's in, uh, done in Sweden. And as you know, they can track people for their lifetimes. And this is a test of bariatric surgery on mortality in the Swedish obese uh, subject study. So they are uh, people who are getting a control uh, diet or they get banding or they get a gastric bypass. And gastric bypass, you can see, drops your weight by about 25%. Uh, and it maintains that for a good 15 years. And you can see that there's a clear difference in mortality in the control group and the surgery group. So bariatric surgery, and who were they operating? These are uh, uh, women who had a BMI more than 38 or men more than uh, 34, and they were obese and they had one other complication. So they were not terribly, terribly obese, but they had pretty reasonable people that they did the surgery on. And when they looked at even a longer term follow-up uh, lasting out to 40 years, they found that it adds about 3.3 years to your life if you got the surgery. You still lost about five and a half years of life compared to if you didn't have obesity. So you don't quite get to the general population, but you gain 3.3 years of life if you, if you get uh, the surgery done. So just to point out that, look, this is bariatric surgery, but now we have medications that can lead to that much weight loss. Uh, we don't have data that far out, but something that we should probably keep in the back of my, our minds. Cessation of tobacco use, pretty obvious to everyone, but you know they, they have very nice guidelines of the United States Preventive Services Task, Task Force. I uh, was looking at the New England Journal of Medicine today and they are under fire again uh, for, uh, there are some lawsuits in Texas and they are under fire but very nice editorial that supports USPTF for their services. And they say that treat smoking as a vital sign. Ask people if they smoke. But if you just ask them, do you smoke? You might not get the true answer because vaping might not be considered smoking by people or chewing tobacco might not be considered smoking by people. So you have to ask, do you use tobacco in any form? And they say, ask, advise, refer, behavioral counseling, and pharmacotherapy. So it's sort of an evolved field now to uh, overcome this powerful addiction in people. Now, switching on to CKD epidemiology, you can see that worldwide, the number of people with kidney transplants and kidney replacement therapy is dramatically increasing. And again, in countries which have the fewest resources, uh, there's the greatest burden of disease. And it turns out that if you want to assess kidney disease, it's fairly simple. It's like the TNM for cancer. You have the uh, EGFR and albuminuria for kidney disease. We just have two domains. And uh, essentially, whenever the GFR starts dropping, you have increased risk of multiple risk factor, multiple outcomes, including all-cause mortality, cardiovascular death, uh, AKI, uh, cancers, everything kind of goes up in people with CKD. And this also risk uh, starts increasing with uh, increasing US USCR. Now, USCR, you can see that more than 30 is considered, 30 to 300 is microalbuminuria zone. And you can see that the risk has almost doubled 
in people going from five to 30. So it's a really a continuous risk factor and there's no threshold as such uh, below which you are safe. Um, so we consider this in a bivariate manner and we uh, do a heat map. So you have a normal GFR, no albuminuria, you're on the green zone. If you have a terrible kidney function and a lot of albuminuria in the red zone, so you have this bivariate assessment of uh, kidney function. Now, cardiovascular disease we, uh, is underappreciated in these patients. And I think that uh, part of the reason is that when patients come to see the nephrologist, they are more worried about dialysis and rightly so. But we don't think that these are people who are at increased cardiovascular risk. But the pathophysiology of cardiovascular disease in people with CKD seems to be quite distinctly different. In other words, uh, in people who don't have kidney disease, atherosclerosis seems to be a more predominant mechanism of vascular disease. In people with uh, CKD, it's arteriosclerosis. It's the uh, medial calcification, the calcification of the plaques, et cetera, which seems to be more important. And also the microvascular disease that exists in the kidney doesn't uh, seem to be limited to the kidney, it extends to the heart. So you have what is called the uh, cardiomyocyte capillary mismatch, like a VQ mismatch you have in pulmonary, you have a cardiomyocyte capillary mismatch. The heart uh, muscle grows in size, the capillaries don't keep pace with it. So there's hypoxia and you basically have uh, the people you can see in the middle frame is hypertension, where the capillaries are growing and the rightmost frame is CKD where the, the cardiomyocytes have grown, but the capillaries have not commensurately grown. This was work done by Kirsten Amman and uh, Eberhard Ritz in Heidelberg. And it's uh, kind of uh, pretty well uh, validated now as a way to think about uh, cardiovascular disease in these people. What it translates to, is that people who have progressive kidney disease, they cease to have so much myocardial infarctions and ischemic events. Instead, they tend to have more arteriosclerotic events. In other words, heart failure, sudden deaths, arrhythmias, those tend to be more common, valvular calcification, et cetera. They tend to be more common. And after a kidney disease has progressed to a certain point, the atherosclerotic uh, is sort of plateaus. And if even if you look at the clinical trials done in people with type 2 diabetes, the number of events that you gather with uh, strokes or myocardial infarctions, they're a fraction of that with heart failure hospitalizations because it seems like it's uh, reflecting the pathophysiology. There's a a study that uh, was done longitudinally is a chronic uh, renal insufficiency cohort study or CRIC study um, that was funded by NIDDK. And what they uh, did in that study looked at the nature of the plaque uh, using MRIs. So what they find is that if you have a necrotic core in the, in the plaque, then you have more cardiovascular events that we have known for a long time. What we also know is that if you have CKD, you have more cardiovascular events. But they found that people with CKD have less necrotic core, yet they have more events. Again, kind of indirectly suggesting that it's not the atherosclerosis that's increasing the outcomes, but imaging sort of supporting that must be something else, not the atherosclerotic uh, plaque that is causing this. It's also a very interesting data, this time from Yale, uh, where they look at certain factors that are expressed by the kidney. In this case, renalase. The renalase is an enzyme that's uh, secreted by the kidney, and it leads to neutralization of catecholamines. That's why it's called ACE, renalase. It's by the kidney, and it's lysing uh, catecholamines. And when you, uh, when you have a wild type uh, animal, uh, you don't have uh, as much myocardial infarction, but if you knock out the renalase in the animal and produce myocardial infarction, the infarct size is much bigger. So what it's telling you 
is perhaps the kidney is producing factors that is protecting the heart. And, you know, just like erythropoietin is producing EPO, here you're producing something in the kidney that's neutralizing catecholamines, and that might be beneficial. And there might be hundreds of molecules like that we don't know about. Sometimes uh, it's unfortunate because we find patients who have CKD, they come in the first time and they're dead. They don't get second chances. So in people who have no CKD, it's less likely to be fatal when they have CKD and more advanced CKD, the fatality rises. So we, we, we kind of understand that this might be something which is a 911 when we find something which is atherosclerotic in nature. Now, moving on to the clinical trial evidence to prevent cardiorenal disease, I'm going to start at the beginning, which is blood pressure control. And these were uh, studies done in about a dozen patients, 1982, uh, Karl-Erik uh, Mogensen in Denmark at Steno Clinic and Parving, his colleague at the Steno uh, Diabetes Center in Copenhagen. They published a study which showed that uh, if you use uh, antihypertensive drugs like beta blockers, or hydralazine, furosemide, thiazides, and control blood pressure, those patients tend to have less progression of kidney disease compared to people who were just left untreated, which was very fascinating in 1980, and they just showed it with a dozen people. Subsequently, the UK PDS uh, tested in type 2 diabetes blood pressure uh, control of less than 150 or 85 versus less than 180 or 105. And this is published in 1998. So if you look at it, it's less than 25 years ago, we were arguing between 150 and 180. And they show that yes, you have a clear separation in blood pressure over time. And there are only about 1500 patients in this trial. And any diabetes endpoint was reduced in people who got better blood pressure control. Uh, by about a quarter. Uh, strokes were reduced about 44%, and microvascular complications, especially uh, retinopathy, by about 37%. And notice that it takes a while before the curve starts separating, at least two to three years before you see a difference in the outcomes, but the differences continue to stay separated. And most of the effect is in microvascular disease and uh, strokes no effect on myocardial infarction. So myocardial infarction is more atherosclerotic pathway and perhaps statins and other uh, uh, interventions might be more helpful there. So uh, to summarize the blood pressure control, it's the essential first step in management. Current guidelines is a gold blood pressure of less than 130 or 80. And you have to measure it right using the guidelines, not just the casual blood pressure. ACE and ARBs are the first line therapy in patients with albuminuria, but not both. And combination therapy, that means ASR with a diuretic or ASR with a calcium channel blocker, they seem to be tolerated better and lead to better blood pressure control. Not everything that is new works. Uh, we did a study uh, looking at chlorothaladone in pretty advanced kidney disease. These are people with stage four kidney failure. And it seemed like it reduced blood pressure by 10 and a half millimeter mercury on top of existing therapy, which is a mean of three drugs. And even if you look at uh, uh, resistant hypertension in this group, which was a large fraction of the patients, it really improved. And it was independent of whether they had diabetes or no diabetes. Well, uh, we've talked a lot about uh, these uh, things, but as physicians, we know that uh, not one strategy works we have to apply multiple strategies. And in Steno-2 trials, they simply randomized 160 patients with type 2 diabetes and moderately increased albuminuria to either conventional or intensive multifactorial therapy. So the multiple interventions included behavioral modification, which included diet, exercise, and smoking cessation, and pharmacological modification that included ACE or ARBs, metformin or insulin, thiazides, and beta blockers. Very simple, whatever we have talked about so far. In 1984, Mogensen had described albuminuria in a New England Journal paper. He had uh, N of six, and you know he was the only author on that paper. 
In 1999, uh, they published this study in New England Journal and showed that it reduced microvascular complications of both nephropathy and retinopathy. In 2003, uh, about eight years later, they showed a 50% reduction in risk of cardiovascular and microvascular events. In 2008, they showed a mortality benefit. And 2016, the risks were, the benefits were still maintained, all with 160 patients followed longitudinally. Uh, kind of telling you that these interventions can really work. So ASO ARBs uh, are effective. The, uh, the captopril was described in type 1 diabetes, but really in type 2 diabetes, it was the Irbisartan and Losartan trials uh, in 2003. Renal uh, showed about a fifth reduction in dialysis, and so did IDNT. So ASO ARBs are indicated in any patient with type 2 diabetes and albuminuria, contraindicated in pregnancy. And you have to monitor potassium and watch for hypertension and AKI when the patient is sick. Now, this is what we had till a few years ago. And you know, we showed that in renal and IDNT, you have a fifth reduction in kidney failure outcomes, but you had a huge residual risk shown with this red uh, shaded bar. So what did we do about it? Well, we tried really hard for the next uh, 20 years almost. We tried various therapies uh, to reduce the rate of progression of kidney disease. Unfortunately, none of them worked. But it was in 2019 that we got lucky and we found a canagliflozin, which people were just uh, uh, sneezing at and say, well, gee, you really think a drug that weighs glucose is going to save kidneys? And you know, lo and behold, uh, it was a call I got at night. I was uh, actually the chair of the adjudication committee of this trial. And they called an emergency meeting of the steering committee members. And the emergency meeting was because the data safety monitoring board had said, please halt the trial. You have overwhelming efficacy. And people were nervous. We said, hey, you're looking for both cardiovascular protection and kidney protection. We want both. We just don't want one. Are you really doing the right thing? But, you know, we uh, obviously know that we, we did the right thing by stopping the trial. Prior to this trial, most of the studies were done uh, as part of uh, the regulatory approval that FDA requires for cardiovascular safety, uh, Declare, Canvas, and Pareg. They were not trials to look at uh, kidney protection uh, till we came up with the, uh, the uh, Credence trial with canagliflozin in people with type 2 diabetes, overt albuminuria. So they had to have a USCR between 300 to 5,000, and they all had to have a GFR of at least over 30. The primary outcome was end stage kidney disease, doubling of serum creatinine, or renal or cardiovascular death. And you can see that there's a 30% relative risk reduction. The p-value has uh, really small, and that's why the trial was stopped. The curves start separating pretty early, about 12 months, and they stay uh, separate uh, for a long time. What are the downsides of it? Well, uh, genital mycotic infections, that's the bane of uh, SGLT2 inhibitors. And I think it's also something that a lot of people once they get it, they never want to go on this drug. I have had many patients say, doc, I don't want to go on your drug. You know, you're giving a drug to prevent something. They get something that they don't like. They said, we don't care what you say. We don't want this drug. So it becomes an issue. And of course, a rare complication is diabetic ketoacidosis. More recent data suggests that when you combine um, uh, trial data from uh, multiple uh, trials in type 2 diabetes, there's also a signal for limb amputation uh, that is not there in any one trial uh, alone. On the heels of this trial, we came up with dapagliflozin, a cousin of an, uh, it, uh, canagliflozin. And this trial was important because it was done in people with and without diabetes. And the primary composite outcome showed a reduction of nearly 40% in cardiorenal outcome. The renal specific outcome was improved the death from cardiovascular causes of hospitalization for heart failure was reduced 39%. And death from any cause was also reduced by 31%, which is really a hard endpoint to hit, but they had this 
The most recent addition is the empagliflozin in patients with chronic kidney disease. And this trial is important because it reduced the, uh, the threshold of GFR down to 20. Uh, prior trials didn't go that low. Also, it allowed inclusion of people without albuminuria. And also, it allowed inclusion of people who had not been on ACE or ARBs, about 10 to 15% of the patients who are not on ACE or ARBs in this trial. So it kind of broadened the population to look at, uh, again, a cardiorenal outcome. Again, this trial was stopped early uh, because it uh, met its primary endpoint, a 28% relative risk reduction. So you can see the consistency of effect across all trials in the cardiorenal protection. Unfortunately, uh, if you focus on the bottom, uh, the effects are there limited to people who have a, a USCR more than 300. In people who have less than 30 USCR or 30 to 300 USCR, there's not much of an effect. So uh, my interpretation is that if, if a patient has type two diabetes with albuminuria, and I go with more than 200 because that's what dapagliflozin used, and EGFR more than 20, I use 20 because that's the lowest GFR that empagliflozin used. Then, and if the patient is on an optimal dose of uh, ASO ARB, then I think we should use this drug. Now, if I can't use this drug in that patient, I'd like to find out another reason. So if you have HEFPEF, HEFREF, I'd use it. If you have uh, a patient with uh, cardiovascular disease, for example, type two diabetes and existing cardiovascular disease, you can see it's in the label of empagliflozin that's indicated for cardiovascular protection. So it, there are many reasons that we can use these drugs, but uh, they, they are really, game changers as far as we can uh, see. Now, credence and dapagliflozin, empagliflozin, we still have residual risk. You know, we haven't wiped out kidney disease. And the question is, can we add on more? And here where we come up with the uh, with the drugs that block the monocorticoid receptor. And when we look at meta-analyses, we see, oh yes, they can reduce blood pressure, they can reduce proteinuria, they might be good. The question we have always dreamed of is, can we block the monocorticoid receptor yet not cause hyperkalemia? <laughs> People say, how is it possible? You're blocking the MR. You're going to produce hyperkalemia. Otherwise, you're not blocking monocorticoid receptor. So let's ponder this point a little bit more. Uh, it turns out that monocorticoid receptor is not just there in the kidney. It's there in many tissues. Um, specifically, it's there in myeloid cells, monocytes. And uh, it's, a, it's an experiment they did in Australia and Melbourne in Greg Tesh's lab. And they uh, asked the question that if we do a site-specific monocortical receptor knockout in the myeloid cells versus looking at the podocyte, can we protect the kidney? And they said, well, the podocyte is important. So if we knock it out there, maybe we'll protect the kidney. And the monocyte is okay. It's just as a control. We got really a surprising result. It was the other way around. The myeloid receptor was what was important for protecting the kidney and not so much the podocyte. And that's a fascinating wow. result because it led to development of a story where they said, well, can we develop a molecule now that doesn't block the monocorticoid receptor as much in the kidney, but it can perhaps uh, block it elsewhere. And that's where they came up with phenernone. It was really a marvel of uh, engineering because they did a high throughput screening of about a million compounds. And they found a dihydropyridine, a drug like amlodipine, and they modified it to, uh, to optimize the molecule so it would block the monocortical receptor, have a very short half-life between uh, two to four hours and still uh, do the work. And when they, did the same experiment that they did in Greg Tesh's lab with a knockout with this new drug, the BR4628, they found an identical result. They said that, oh, the drug is actually working to improve kidney outcomes in animals who have rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis compared to controls. So they said, well, let's compare it with eplernone and see how it compares to eplernone. Eplernone, as you know, is a steroidal MR antagonist. 
and they compared one milligram of phenernone to uh, 10 milligrams of uh, plurnone because they produce approximately the same amount of sodium loss in the urine. And what they found was that if they use phenernone, they had less proteinuria, less glomerulopathy. And when they repeated the experiments in the heart comparing plurnone and phenernone, they found less cardiac inflammation and fibrosis and less collagen deposition compared to uh, uh, the, uh, the comparator. So then uh, a flight started say, okay, let's see if it's really going to work in humans. And they did phase two studies. There's pretty large studies uh, in aggregate about 5,000 patients in phase two studies. They're all called ARTS program. Uh, the first ARTS program was in people with CKD and heart failure. They compared it with spir spironolactone. In ARTS HF, they had patients with HEFREF and they compared it with eplernone. And arts dn was in people with CKD and albuminuria, and the comparator was placebo. When you look at potassium, compared to placebo, phenernone increases potassium. But when you look at aplernone, it's similar to aplernone. When you look at with spironolactone, it's less than spironolactone. So the hyperkalemic potential appears to be similar to aplernone, but the problem uh, is that, you know, you might say, okay, so why can't you use a plurinone? Well, because if you look at the outcome of all-cause mortality and heart failure hospitalization, in just a 12-week trial, a plurinone was beat by phenernone. So it says, okay, well, you know, it seems like we need to invest in large phase three trials to see if this is going to work. And of course, we had a nice dose-response relationship between the dose of, of uh, phenernone we used and reduction in albuminuria. So we then designed a program of nearly 13,000 patients to see if we could re reduce cardiovascular outcomes and kidney failure outcomes. To me, the more important point is the cardiovascular outcome. We have already shown kidney improvement with ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, but there are very few trials that have targeted cardiovascular outcomes in people with type two diabetes. And FIGRO trial was powered to, primary outcome was a composite endpoint of time to CV death, non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, or hospitalization for heart failure. And fidelity was a pooled analysis of these two trials. And it turns out that is a pretty broad category of patients. In Fidelio, we have a GFR between 25 and 75. In Figaro, anything above 25 will do. And together in Fidelity, we have more than 13,000 patients. We excluded people with HEFREF because in those people, you might want to use spironolactone. It's a level 1A indication in those patients. So we're not talking about that. We're talking about prevention of cardiovascular disease and prevention of kidney disease progression in people with type 2 diabetes. And that's why we're not competing with heart failure. We also excluded people with uncontrolled arterial hypertension. And we excluded people who are prone to get hyperkalemic. In this trial, potassium at most could be 4.8 before you can get in the trial. And when we look at the total analysis of 13,000 patients, we find that baseline EGFR is about uh, uh, 44 in the entire trial. The mean age is 65 blood pressure 137, cardiovascular disease in about 46%, mean potassium about 4.4, statin use in 72%, RASI use, which is ASOR in nearly all the patients, and SGLT2 inhibitors in about 7% of the patients. So you can see that it's a very well-treated population of patients who have reasonable blood pressure, statin use, A1C. And when we look at the cardiovascular outcome, it's improved with on top of other effective therapies, including statins, ACE and ARB, and good blood pressure control. That's a 14% relative risk reduction. The NNT is 46. So you, after, if you have treated 46 patients for three years, you will prevent one cardiovascular outcome. What is driving the endpoint? Uh, uh, it is not myocardial infarctions or strokes as much. It's mostly cardiovascular death and hosp hospitalization for heart failure. To me, it indicates it's the non-atherosclerotic factors that are probably more being influenced by these pathways. 
Uh, when we look at the kidney outcome, it's a 23% relative risk reduction. The absolute, the relative risk reduction is 23% compared to 14% with cardiovascular. But the NNT is higher at 60 compared to 46. The reason for this is that the absolute risk for cardiovascular events in people with type 2 diabetes is higher. And that's why the NNT is lower, even though the relative risk is only reduced 14%. So really, CKD is a cardiovascular disease risk factor that is modifiable with the use of an agent that can block the non MRA. When we look at uh, uh, the outcomes of kidney failure, to me, the most important point is that you can stop uh, or you can reduce the need for dialysis by a fifth. So ESKD is reduced by a fifth. That's a big deal. You know, we can, we can play games, 40% reduction in GFR, 57%. But dialysis is dialysis. If you put me on dialysis or yourself on dialysis, your life will change the very day that you go on dialysis. That's a life-changing event. And that is reduced 20% with this drug. Hyperkalemia is really the major side effect that you observe. And you, you see it, uh, there's about a doubling of incidence. But the discontinuations because of hyperkalemia are small, 0.6% with the placebo, 1.7% with uh, the treated group. So essentially, you can expect a fifth reduction in dialysis, a fifth reduction in heart failure, and you can use this drug if GFR is more than 25 and K is five or less. That's what the package insert says. Moving on to GLP-1 RA, exciting drugs. They uh, release incretins and they can reduce the uh, glucagon release and stimulate insulin release. And just focusing on the outcomes of atherosclerotic outcomes, if you look at cardiovascular mortality and kidney outcomes, we find that MI stroke CV death is reduced by 14% in a meta-analysis. Um, and it's across the board, the atherosclerotic events seem to be better modified with the GLP-1 RAs. It turns out that the effect seems to be more in people with the GFR, which is more than 60 compared to less than 60. And this has led to the design of some trials that are going to be announced uh, in a couple of years. One is called the FLOW trial. The other one is called the uh, SOL trial. And the flow trial is being done with semaglutide in people with CKD and looking for cardiorenal protection in those individuals. There's now a dual uh, GLP-1 and glucose and vitri polypeptide receptor agonist, which is terzipatide. Uh, this is made by Lilly the, from the town I live in in Indianapolis. Terzipatide was compared to semaglutide in this uh, New England Journal paper. And it seems like uh, it's uh, pretty effective in uh, especially dropping the glycated hemoglobin and most important, the weight. With terzipatide 15 milligram, you have a remarkable reduction on, in weight, about uh, 12, 13% uh, from baseline. And you know we, we have uh, some outcome studies that are pending with uh, this. Uh, blood pressure is improved. There are some preliminary data that show that USCR is improved in these patients. So in summary, I'll leave you uh, with the final thoughts. Uh, diabetes uh, is, is a global uh, epidemic. And especially in South Asia, so many of my family members have uh, diabetes. And when I look at uh, people, I just went to a funeral yesterday of an Indian man, 62 years old, he just dropped dead. And, you know, we see it all the time. And this is something that we need to do something about. And uh, I just uh, look at the ABC. A is for albuminuria. In nephrology and other specialties, A is forgotten because we think about GFR as CKD. But if we are just doing that, we are missing a lot of disease. If we don't look at urine albumin to creatinine ratio and diagnose the disease early, we will have less opportunity to intervene early where we can do a lot for these patients.
we discussed the lifestyle measures, the healthy diet, physical activity, weight, and cessation of tobacco use, and the six S's that we went through. And then, of course, the uh, numerous drugs we have now that were mandated by the FDA to show cardiovascular safety and turned around that we got a gift that they actually protect the heart and also the kidney. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. Um, maybe we could start with questions here in the audience. Um, we have about 60, 65 people online as well. So we'll uh, try to get their attention also, but sure, up here. Thank you, Fred, great talk. I'm curious about the GLP-1 agonist. Do you feel like the improvement in the outcomes is related strictly because of their weight loss effect or it's inherent to their properties as well? Do you think this is you know, that the improvement in blood pressure, albuminuria, general CKT outcomes, is it related to the weight loss or that's a great question. I don't think we know the entire answer. I think weight loss is definitely a part of it, but GLP-1 uh, is expressed in the endothelium and it has uh, uh, very important effects uh, as an anti-inflammatory drug. Uh, it has effects on the stem cells, et cetera. And I think it's possible that it has multifactorial benefits. For example, we for um, SGLT2 inhibitors. We have so much data to show that they work. Do we really know how they work? We debate about it. Um, I don't think we know it. Uh, I think that we probably will find out in the future uh, when people tease it more and we have more data. Uh, weight loss is probably a part of it, but probably not all of it. Thank you, it was a great presentation. I have a couple questions. <clears throat> the first is, uh, I, you didn't touch, touch on the flow tandem trials in great detail, but you know the biggest controversy uh, or not would be the difference between NCTC versus flow therapy. Um, one, of course, is late stage CKD, but then uh, earlier stages. Do you have a preference and uh, why do you want to use one over the other in different stages of CKD? Yeah, so um, Dr. Gupta has asked uh, for the people who are online, is that uh, can you give us some idea on the controversy between HCTZ versus chlorthalidone? And this is the VIA cooperative study that was recently completed, which was called the Diuretic Comparison Project. And they had you know upwards of 10,000 patients that were switched from people who are getting hydrochlorothiazide in a dose of at least 25 milligram to either chlorothalidone or keep on the existing therapy. After they were asked by their physician, is it okay to switch? And they found that if you followed them over time, there's no difference in cardiovascular outcomes. So um, what does that trial tell us? Well, first of all, the switch could be made if the blood pressure was more than 120. So these were not uncontrolled hypertensives who were randomized to either chlorothalidone or hydrochlorothiazide. It's not a randomized controlled trial. It's a switch trial. You're tolerating HCDC just fine. I'm going to switch you to the other drug, even if your uh, blood pressure is 120. So what's telling me is that if you have a patient with hydrochlorothiazide whose blood pressure is controlled, just leave them alone. They'll be doing fine. If you have a patient who has stage four CKD, like uh, we did in our study, um, I think we I would use chlorothalidone because that's where the evidence is because it's a placebo control trial. I'm not comparing to diuretics, but I'm just comparing chlorothalidone to placebo. And what I find is that in people who are already on a loop diuretic, you get much more increase in creatinine if you are on a loop diuretic. If I use just 12.5 milligrams of chlorothalidone once a day. So what I do now is that in people who are on loop diuretics and who are poorly controlled and have stage four kidney disease, I put them on a half a pill three times a week of chlorothalidone. And they do just fine because it's very hard to cut a pill in a quarter. 6.25 is very hard to do. And the least strength we have with chlorothalidone is 25. So I use 12 and a half, three times a week 
And if the people are still uncontrolled, I'd go to 12.5. Uh, the advantage is that you can actually see a slight decline in potassium. So unlike spinal lactone, which raises potassium, this actually lowers potassium. And if the patient's already on ACE or ARB, you're not sort of thinking, oh, will the patient get hyperkalemic? But you just have to respect this drug. It's a very powerful drug, especially when used with loop diuretic. My second question is about the combination of SGMT2 with glimmerine. Yes. Uh, and uh, what your thoughts are? Yes. Second question is, uh, what are your thoughts on the combination of SGLT2 inhibitor and phenernone? Great question. Uh, so uh, we don't have firm data on that. We are doing a trial called the CONFIDENCE trial, where patients, there are about 800 patients who are randomized to either phenernone alone, uh, uh, empagliflozin alone, are the combination of two right from the get-go. And looking at a reduction in USCR from baseline to six months. And asking whether the combination is better than either one of them alone. When we look at post hoc analyses of other trials, we find a strong signal that whenever you use them in combination, there's less risk of hyperkalemia. So whatever hyperkalemia, there's a low finite risk of hyperkalemia with phenernone, and uh, there's mitigation of that risk with, uh, with uh, SGLT2 inhibitor. There are also some data, again, post hoc from these analyses that we have done, is that when you use it in combination, it seems to uh, have a better effect on USCR reduction, et cetera. But the randomized trials will need to be done to definitely answer that question. Because remember, whenever we're doing a post hoc analysis, people are already receiving SGLT2 inhibitor in the past, and then we are randomizing them to phenernone or placebo, right? So it's not truly randomized to both these drugs right from the get go versus one alone. So we have to be cautious in the post hoc analysis. But, uh, you know, in a couple of years, we should have the answer to these questions. Yes. On, on the same aspect, what Dr. Gupta asked is, when I, as a clinician, see the patient, we give an ACE or ARB and then SCLT2 inhibitor. What do you think about additional benefit on top of this two drug adding a GLP-1 from the kidney point of view, from the kidney outcome point of view? Would you, is it helpful or because we still don't have that comparative data of combination? Right. You, I mean, yeah, very good question. So the question is, uh, you have multiple strategies now. You have ACE inhibitor, you have SGLT2 inhibitor, and now you are adding GLP-1 RA. Are there data to support the use of additional treatments uh, in terms of benefits? The honest answer is we don't have data, right? Because um, we, uh, even in, if you look at the heart failure literature where they have multiple heart failure drugs, they usually test one drug versus placebo, and then they will do a post hoc analysis. In other words, what you are asking is that, shouldn't we do a trial where people are on these two drugs, and then you randomize to a GLP-1 RA or placebo and look at the outcomes, cardiovascular and renal? You could. The number of patients you'll require is huge, like 20,000 patients or so, because the event rates become small. And it's unlikely those trials will be done. So what do you rely on? Do you rely on the surrogacy of the endpoint, which is uh, improvements in albuminuria and things like that. I think the flow trial will partially address that question because they are looking at hard outcomes in people who are randomized to semaglutide. The data we have so far is that these drugs reduce albuminuria. The GLP-1 RAs reduce albuminuria. Terzipatide in post hoc analyses, they improved albuminuria. But that, does that translate into heart kidney outcomes? That answer we don't know. I, uh, thank you. Very much. Um, I just wanted to peek into your uh, practice chart from the perspective of CMT2. Because you know, there is that camp, or not camp, but there are people who say, you know, infectious risk is to be accounted for when you're using this. And there are others who say, so, you know, the benefits are so, uh, so evident that it, you know, trying to overcome that is, is better, and keeping the patient on the drug is better than you know, being afraid because, because of this infectious risk. Uh, my first part of my question is how do you 
you, uh, is there a patient population that you're afraid of using SCF inhibitors as a starting point? And if they do have infectious complications such as GPS, but are still willing to be on SCF inhibitors, how do you, do you stop and reintroduce it? How do you Great question. So I'll uh, repeat that question for those people who are online. The, uh, the question is that how do you address the issue of infections and balance it with the net benefit, uh, especially in the vulnerable population, people who have kidney disease, who might have multiple UTIs, et cetera? Uh, are you worried about them? Um, I think as, as uh, physicians, uh, no guideline will ever be able to replace your judgment at the bedside. There are people, I absolutely will not use as GLT-2 inhibitors. These are people who have indwelling Foley catheters. These are people who have uh, kidney stones, true white stones, they come in, they always have white cells in the urine. I said, no, I'm not going to, or there are people who have, you know, they get intravesical chemotherapy, bladder cancer and all. I'm not going to touch SGLT2 inhibitors in those group of patients, right? Aside from that, I tell the patient that, look, uh, I'm giving you these uh, drugs. Uh, I'm going to reduce your risk of kidney failure by about a third and heart failure hospitalization by about a third. But there's a small chance that I might increase the risk for general myocardial infections, maybe some urinary infections, and very rarely diabetic ketoacidosis. I'll tell you a story. I had a patient who was a World War II veteran. He was 93 years old and he had proteinuria and he never wanted to go on dialysis. I said, okay, I'm going to start you on an SCLT2 inhibitor. I did. And the pharmacy, first of all, overruled me and I had to go to the director and say, no, it's my call. And so I was approved for using this as, this was the days when we had to get prior authorization from the pharmacist, no longer the case now. The patient took the drug religiously. And after he came for the refill, the pharmacist wanted to stop. So this daughter calls me and says, doc, they're stopping it. I'm telling them not to stop it. He continued the drug. Six months later, he came down with a urinary tract infection. So we stopped the drug. We restarted it, and six months later, he came back again with a urinary tract infection. And I said, you know, you have had two urinary tract infections. You have never had urinary tract infections in the past. This drug is not working for you. It's not worth it. Because he would come in with an altered mental status, right? So this is the Bayesian system, right? you are looking at the prior probability of improving an outcome of kidney failure or cardiovascular outcome, which seems reasonable. But for the individual, if it's producing some side effects is, no, this is not for you. That's your clinical reasoning. And I think as physicians, we should stick to that clinical reasoning. The book won't tell you, oh, you should stop it or not stop it. But he says, okay, two times is enough for me. I'm not giving it to you because you're coming into our altered mental status. This is not worth it. Thank right. you so much Thank for you. a wonderful lecture. Appreciate it. You're welcome.